Thank, thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us to guide us along the way. We, we, we declare that your promises are true, and your goodness and your love never fails us. In this moment, we come to you and we lay our lives before you. May we honor, worship, and adore you with every fiber of our being. Father, we proclaim that you are the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Your beauty and majesty reigns supreme. And on this day, we join with all those who worship and confess you as Lord from generations past and generations present. And with those, all the angels, sing to heaven our, the greatness and splendor of your name. Lord, we adore you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we bow our hearts and worship you this morning. And it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, Luke writes, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Does your life show Jesus? Are you letting others see Jesus in you? Let's sing together.
Israelites, and whatever you do in word or deed, do it all to the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's stand and sing. Take the name of Jesus with it. I stand here this morning, once a soul that was lost and dying and going to hell, but there was a day. There was a day where somebody loved me enough 
to tell me about Jesus Christ and how he could not only save my soul from hell, but how he could change my life here and now. And I praise his name this morning. And if you are here this morning, and Jesus Christ has done the very same thing for you, you know exactly how I feel. However, salvation is not to be just a feeling. It is to be a change of direction in life so that we may go and therefore reach the lost and make disciples of all men. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that, Father, you look down on a wretched soul such as I. Look beyond my sin and my brokenness. And, Father, you saw something that you could make into a creature that would not only follow you, but, Lord, that you could use and go on to make a difference here in this world. And, Father, for each one in this sanctuary this morning, you saw the very same thing. But, Father, as you told your disciples when you called them, Father, you did not save us again for us to keep the precious gift of salvation unto ourself. You saved our very souls that we may go out and become soldiers for Jesus Christ. And Lord, in the day that we live, we need more soldiers who are willing to go into this battle. And because of what you've done for us, we need to go and share that very same message with others. So Lord, this morning, may your message, may your word resonate in the hearts and in the souls of everyone in this place this morning. Lord, may hearts be encouraged and also emboldened. To go and to be obedient. And Lord, may everything said be of you. And Lord, may you receive all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about the urgency that we need to have in being effective witnesses for Christ. In fact, I will tell you this morning, as Christians, we're the only ones who can witness. So we must be willing to go and engage this lost culture for the cause of Christ and not run from it like many want us to do today. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, that he has become all things to all men to engage them with the gospel. And that is not saying he will engage in sin in order to go win them to the Lord. But what he was saying in that passage was he was not bound to both, uh, he was not bound to just Jews or Gentiles. His goal was to share the good news of Christ with all men. And as Christians, we must understand that we are called to separation from sin, but not separation from sinners. Let me say that again. We're called to be separate from sin, but we're not called to be separate from sinners. You see, for Christians to identify with Christ, we need to do more of what Christ did. He engaged sinners. And so we need to spend more time with sinners today and not less. We are the only ones, again, who can engage this lost culture with the hope of the gospel. And how did Jesus engage sinners? Well, because he loved people. He confronted, sin, he confronted sinners very lovingly and with compassion. Second, he gave hope to all those who were hurting and that other people would shun. Third, he didn't let negativity nor distractions or even rejection stop his mission. And number four. He kept his focus on doing the Father's will and not the will of other people. But to do that, you and I must also have the same burden for the lost that Jesus did. In fact, I'm going to say this morning that if you don't have a burden for the lost, then something is wrong with your relationship with Jesus Christ. But I will tell you, sadly, there are many who don't have a burden for lost people today. 
A recent survey by George Barney, you may have heard of him, he's a Christian pollster, found that only half or roughly 53% of born-again Christians today feel a sense of urgency or responsibility to tell others about their faith. That's very sad. But I want you to compare that to these quotes from other believers who have lived generations before us. David Brainerd lived from April 1718 to October of 1747. He was an American missionary to the Native Americans. And he had a very fruitful ministry among the Delaware Indians in New Jersey. He lived a very short life. He had a lot of difficulties in his life. But he made, you, he, made, he, he made a huge difference among those people. But listen to what he said. He said, I cared not where or how I lived or what hardships I had to go through so that I could gain souls for Christ. Many of you have heard of George Whitfield. He died, he lived from 1714 to 1770, evangelist out of the Church of England. And this is what he said. Lord, give me souls or take my soul. What a burden. Henry Martin lived in the late 1700s to the early 1800s. He was a missionary to the people of India and Persia, and this is what he said. Here, let me burn out for God. William Booth lived from 1829 to August 1912, was a British Methodist preacher. He's also the founder of the Salvation Army. And this is what he said. I am very tired, but must go on. A fire is in my bones. Oh, God, what can I say? Souls, souls, souls. My heart hungers for souls. And lastly, R.A. Torrey, a great evangelist, teacher, author, born in Hoboken, New Jersey. He was once lost, really was filled with much skepticism, but eventually he came to Christ and trusted him as his Savior. And this is what he said. He said, I would rather win souls than be the greatest king or emperor on earth. My one ambition in life is to win as many as possible. Those are the stories and the words of many who have gone before us. But then listen, if that's not enough, listen to what the Apostle Paul himself said in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. He said, I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Did you hear what Paul said? He was willing to give up his very own salvation to see his Jewish brethren come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So considering these who have lived before us, but has also given us a great example to follow, I want you to contemplate these questions with me this morning. Number one, are you and I burdened, truly burdened for the lost? And if we are, just how badly? Is our focus in life to do all that we can do while we have breath to reach the lost for Christ? And what are you willing to do in order to reach the lost for Christ? And then lastly, how much of your time are you willing to give to not only reach the lost, but also to, to disciple those who are newly saved? You see, these are questions that I had to ask myself. And these questions are very important, especially considering the time that we find ourselves living today. You see, as Christians, that is what we are called to do once we are saved. We're called to reach the lost and then disciple them in their relationship and in their growth with Jesus Christ. And you may say, well, Brother Bob, that's your job. No, that's all our jobs. It's not just ministers who are called to do this. Jesus gave that mandate to all those who would come and follow after him. So with that in mind, I want to share a passage with you this morning that shows just how Jesus shared the message of the gospel with all those who needed it most. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 4. Many of you have heard this passage read many times. You may have heard it taught on or preached on many times. But this morning, I want to challenge you to let it change you. And then I want you to let it lead you to a newfound burden for the loss that we have all around us today. 
in order that we may reach them just like Jesus reached this woman here. I'm not going to ask you to stand because this passage is so long, but I want you to follow along as I break it down as we go. And I believe if you will take these four things I want to share with you out of this passage this morning and apply it in your everyday life, you can become an effective witness and you'll see the fruit of your labor become obvious. And I'll break these verses down as I go, but first look with me at verses 1 through 4 in John chapter 4. It says, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. The first thing you and I need to realize if we're going to be an effective witness today is we have to be willing to go just like Jesus was willing to go. And we must go always in faith. And we must always be willing to engage those who are in desperate need of the gospel. And you must go where God says go, by the way. And that's not always the easiest place. It could be the most difficult place. The key is being obedient to go wherever he says go. You see, the disciples even had no real burden for the Samaritans. In fact, the Jews looked at them as inferior they were abusive, and they looked at them as rude toward the cause of Christ. I'll prove it to you. In Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56, this is what it says. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. He saw, they saw Jesus looking toward the Jews not them. So when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. You see, the Jews never wanted to go through Samaria. They would avoid Samaria at all costs because they did not want to encounter the Samaritans. But you and I today must realize that we're not to be in a position of judgment if we're going to truly be an effective witness. We must never forget, I've said this in this pulpit since I've been here, we must never forget who we once were and who we currently are. Because unless we remember who we once were and who we currently are, how can we go and offer grace and mercy and unconditional love to those who need it most? We were all at one time in need of a Savior, and now every single day, if we know Christ, we're in need of a Lord who will lead us and guide us through the power of His Holy Spirit. So no matter whether you considered yourself the vilest among all sinners, like I have, or whether you consider your sin small, you just like me, needed a Savior. So we must be willing to go where others won't go, to accept the risk that others may not accept, and go always in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we must go even when others say we shouldn't go. You and I must always ignore any naysayers out there today and always be obedient to God and God alone. But I will tell you, it's not always easy. And it requires great trust and also courage. And you're going to have to ask yourself, do I really trust God? Because that's really what it's going to come down to. And you must ask Him, just like me, to give you the courage to do whatever it is and to go wherever it is He calls you to go and do. You see, Jesus didn't worry about anything or anyone else, he was focused about doing always his Father's will. So once we make the decision to go and to engage the lost, here's the second thing we must be willing to do. And that is we must be willing to get to know the people we are engaging. Verses 5 through 9. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being worried from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. 
Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For, G for Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You see, this woman was shocked here for two reasons. First off, that anyone else was at the well besides her at this hour of the day. And secondly, that the person who was there engaging her in conversation was a Jew. This lady had been shunned and ridiculed by society because she had a reputation because of her sin. And that is why she would always go to the well at the hottest part of the day because nobody else would be there. And then for a Jew to be talking with her, it took her by great surprise. Now look down real quick to verses 15 through 19. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me, the, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mount, and you, Jesus, say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now, I went ahead and read verse 20. But here's what I want you to see. Jesus has, I want you to see Jesus here had a distinct advantage in that he already knew all about this woman because he was Jesus. But I don't want you to miss this. Since we are not Jesus, you and I are going to have to take the time to listen and get to know the person that we are trying to witness to. And we get to know who they are by first listening to them. Because without listening, you can't really know anyone. You know, you can only get to know someone also by asking the right questions or by answering their questions as well. And that was part of the conversation here Jesus had with this woman. You see, Jesus was willing to ask the right questions because he knew what right questions to ask. But also Jesus listened to her responses. But also he was willing to answer any questions she, she might have. But Jesus did it also, don't miss this, in a non-offensive way. That's the way you and I have to do it as well. If you're going to get to know someone and be an effective witness, you must understand that when you engage those who are lost, you've got to be ready for anything. I've said this many times. Lost people are going to act lost. They may say things and do things that you find very offensive, but that's okay. You still have to engage them. We cannot expect a lost person to act any other way but lost. So be prepared for what you might hear. They may, something, they may say something or do something offensive. But you must ask the right questions by being willing to engage them. But not only do we see Jesus taking the time here to get to know this woman, but that also he engaged anyone else he came in contact the same way that was lost. Sometimes Jesus would initiate the conversation, and sometimes he would respond to the conversation. I want to give you a couple examples of each of these. He initiated the conversation here, again, with the Samaritan woman. But then he did the, all, did the same thing with Zacchaeus, and I'll read Luke 19, 1 through 6. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. I've always been able to identify with Zacchaeus. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, here it is, Jesus engaging him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received, and received him joyfully. But Jesus also responded to people who engaged him. He did that with a rich young ruler, and that's in Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22. And this is what it says. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And the rich young ruler said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Great passage. But unfortunately, 
as you see here, not everyone is always going to respond favorably to the gospel message. But you can still see how compassionately Jesus engaged this rich young ruler. And last, look how Jesus responded in John 8 to the adulterous woman that was brought before him. It says, now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote, on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now you've heard that many times. Many times, no doubt. Please don't miss the importance of what that passage is saying. Jesus always, not sometimes, but Jesus always saw beyond the sin or the sinner to the soul. And if you and I are going to be effective witnesses for him, You and I must look beyond the sin or the sinner and know that inside is a soul that desperately needs to be saved. Jesus responded to this woman with compassion and grace because of her soul. You and I must do the same thing. Again, in order to be an effective witness. So, we must be willing to to go we must be willing to get to know them and then thirdly we must be willing to show them that we really really do care if you look back at verses 6 and 9 here I'll start with verse 6 it said now Jacob's well was there Jesus therefore being wearied from his journey here it is set thus by the well it was about the sixth hour and then verse 9 then the woman of Samaria said to him how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me a Samaritan woman for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans Notice here that Jesus sat down. He said Jesus sat by the well. He wasn't in a hurry. He wasn't on any time frame. He did what others were not willing to do. First to spend some time with this woman and then as a Jew to actually engage in conversation with her. And I will be honest with you this morning, that's not the way most people do it today. We want an in and out quick strategy. Here, take this track, read it. Hey, if you die today, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Well, don't you want to go to heaven? We'll just pray this prayer. And they have no conviction of the heart, and they go away, and they think they're saved, and they've done nothing but repeat a prayer you told them to repeat. That's not the way we're to witness. We're to do it Jesus' way. We must be willing to spend time with them and not be in a hurry. You see, most people, lost people particularly, won't care about what you know or what you want to share with them until they really know that you care about them. It's about their soul. We must slow down. We must be quick to listen and very slow to speak. We must build trust with a person by being real with them and even telling them about ourselves and who we once were. Don't be anxious. Don't get in a hurry. Don't get worried. Just relate to their sin by letting them know that you too are a sinner, but that you have been redeemed and that Jesus can do the same for them. You see, it's not about being done to make you feel good or to check a box that you witnessed hastily to someone. That's what a lot of people want to do today. You can't be in a hurry. You can't seem unengaged because I got news for you. People will see right through you. This is about having a real compassion and a burden for the person's soul. And then taking whatever time is necessary to get to know them by listening to them and talking with them with a heart of compassion. And lastly, once you've made the decision to go, you've gotten to know them, 
You've actually shown them that you genuinely care. It is then and only then that you've earned the right to start to sow the seeds of the gospel. You see that here? Look back in verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who, it, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. 13 and 14, it says, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. This all came after he set, showed this woman he cared by spending time with her. When you sow the seeds of the gospel, you sow seeds of hope. You sow seeds of love, and you do it with compassion. And you sow most importantly, and I said this, and I want to share, I hope I don't run out of time this morning. But you do it best by sharing your testimony of what Christ has done for you and what he can do for them. I want to read to you, you don't have to flip over there, but Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Listen to what? Paul said to the church of Philippi. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul said, everything that's happened to me is part of my testimony. But it's all turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Can I just tell you this morning, hopefully everybody in this sanctuary this morning has a testimony of how Jesus saved your soul. How you turned from a life of sin and you turned and gave your heart and life to Jesus. But can I just tell you, if that's where your testimony ends, that's not good. I have an ongoing testimony, and hopefully you do too, of what Jesus has continued to do over and over and over in your life. Whether good or are bad that turns out for good because you can share what Jesus has done in your life. I've been deathly ill before with an autoimmune disorder. But God has allowed that, what happened to me in my life, to go share with others who have been hurting. Lost loved ones, yes, so I can go share with others who have lost loved ones. Financial difficulty, whatever it is, marital difficulty, whatever it is, everything that happens in your life, you can use for sowing the seeds of the gospel. So share your testimony. Don't be ashamed of your testimony. You see, the fields are just as white unto harvest today as they've ever been. But we must understand that we are the workers in the field. And we don't save anybody. It's the Spirit of God who is the harvester. We need to be the workers. We sow, another may water, Another may may cultivate and pull the weeds around the seeds, whatever. But we got to trust God and him alone to do the saving. You see, Jesus has shown us the way to witness. And he goes on to say this in verses 35 through 38 in our passage. I just shared it. But listen, he said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes a harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. Pathway Baptist Church, lift up your eyes. Behold, look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. Which tells you again, it's not about for any credit we can receive. It's all for the glory of God. And never forget something this morning. You and I don't have to ask for opportunities to witness. We just need to ask God to help us not to miss the opportunities that are around us every single day. But if we are going to be effective witnesses, we must remember that this task is not going to be easy. Because we will, I'll guarantee you, face obstacles. One of the first ones you have to face is you'll have to overcome dissenters. Mark 2, 13 through 17, reminds us of that very fact. It says, Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. And now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners 
also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. And then even in this very passage, if you look back at uh, verse 27 in John 4, it says, And at this point his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking to her? But inside, they were wondering, what are you doing talking to this woman? So you're going to have to overcome dissenters, but secondly, you'll have to overcome distractions. In verse 31 and 34, you see a little bit of that here in this passage. His disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat, of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? You see, the disciples were focused on the physical here, but Jesus was focused on the spiritual. So whatever the distraction that's going to come in your life, you and I must stay focused on the spiritual and not the physical, no matter how difficult it may become. And if we're completely obedient to God in effective witnessing, we're going to face the same kind of dissenters that Jesus did, and we're going to face all sorts of kind of distractions. They will try to lead us to focus on the wrong priorities, or just try to get us to focus on just going about our normal, everyday lives. But if you're going to be an effective witness, you can never be too busy to do the Lord's will. I want to remind us all this morning, He is the giver of every heartbeat and the giver of every breath, which means He's the giver of time. If we are faithful, then we will always be able to see a harvest of some sort, just like what Jesus saw here. In verse 39 here in chapter 4, follow along. And it says, Many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. There's her testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Listen, dissenters, not because of what you said, because we've met him. But I got news for you. Whether you meet him right face to face, or whether you meet him in your life, within your heart and within your soul, when you meet Jesus, everything becomes more clear. That's why it's not up to us to think that we have to save anybody. We just have to love people and share the hope of the gospel. Now listen to me, Pathway Baptist Church. The harvest, the harvest is still just as plentiful today. So never forget that your labor and my labor labor will never, ever be in vain. I think if you're going to be an effective witness, one thing you and I have to realize is we've just got to be faithful to do our part. No matter what comes our way, and then trust the Holy Spirit to do his part. And then we're going to stand before Jesus one day, and I hope every one of us will hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. But if we're going to hope to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, you know what that's going to cause us to have to do? It's not doing things our way. It's doing things his way. It's, be, it's by being obedient to our Lord and Savior, but he's also our master. So this morning, if you're going to be an effective witness, you've got to remember to do the things I told you about. You know? And I hope that every single one of you have been challenged this morning, and I hope you've seen the steps necessary to become an effective witness. But I think the key is, again, you and I must be obedient. We must be obedient to the call of God to witness to the lost. So it's very simple, really. You have to go to where they are. You got to get to know them. You got to show them that you genuinely care about them. And then you earn the right to sow the seed of the gospel. To make it even easier for you. Go, know, show, 
and then you get the right to sow. Go, know, show, and then sow. Out those doors, maybe even in this sanctuary, I don't know, there are people who need to hear about the love of Jesus Christ. And they can hear it by you just sharing what he's done in your life through salvation, but also what he continues to do in your life day by day by day. But you can only do that if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So this morning, I'm going to ask you, if you're in this sanctuary this morning, and you've never, ever trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to do that this morning. Today, today is the day for salvation. It's not about thinking you're saved. It's about knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are saved. It's not about church attendance. Joe said it well. It's not about being baptized. If you've never had a heart change where you repented from your old life and turned to the new life and all things have truly become new and you can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is my Savior but also my Lord and he calls the shots now, then you need to get that right. You know, there are a lot of people sitting in churches all across the world, most likely, but I know in this nation, that have probably repeated a prayer they've been told to pray and think they're okay, but they've never turned their heart and life to Jesus. Can I tell you, I was once one of those. But I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you about the day when it all became new. And my life has never been the same. Never been the same. But this morning you may be here and you may say, you know what? I've lacked the courage. I've lacked the boldness to go and share. Well, just remember, it's not about giving a track. It's not about going through the Romans road. It's about telling people about what Jesus has done for you. And if you don't have a testimony, that's a sign you need to get saved. Listen to me. I have, I have a testimony now. <laughs> you don't have to quote a bunch of scripture. Share what Jesus has done for you. Okay? All right. If you're here this morning and you're visiting, looking for a church home, it's a wonderful church. It's a beautiful church filled with beautiful people, very loving people, very caring people. This is a great church, and I know that they'd be happy to receive you this morning. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pray. We're going to have an invitation, but I don't want you to get up and go anywhere because after the invitation, I want us to have a time of prayer specifically for Brother Rodney and his wife. Is they're about to begin their new ministry here starting Wednesday. And uh, so after the invitation, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll give you cue to what we're going to do. But bow your heads with me as we pray for our invitation. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word. Lord, we thank you for the truth of the word. Father, we thank you that it's your word. And Father, we thank you that if we're in here this morning and we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, that someone took the time to love us enough. To get to know us enough to share the truth of the gospel with us that we may become saved. And Father, in the day that we live, in the urgency of this hour, in the shortness of this hour, Father, may we stand up and be bold witnesses for you. Father, this morning, if there's anyone here who's never truly been born again, who may have prayed a prayer, but they've never truly been born again and turned their life to you, Father, I pray that you draw them this morning. Father, I pray there's anyone here who's been overwhelmed with what it means to share the gospel, that this morning, through the Holy Spirit, you've spoken to them. It's just as simple as being willing to go, get to know them, show them you care, and then share your testimony of what Jesus has done for you. Father, this morning, there's someone here who's visiting and needs to find a church home. This is a great place. I invite you to draw them. Whatever decision needs to be made, Father, I pray right now that your perfect will would be done in Jesus' name. Amen.